Hallelujah. Are you excited to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. Amen. Engage. Somebody say engage. Or say like you mean it, engage. When somebody is engaged, it means the person is out of market. It means the person is out of, exclu uh, uh, out of the search area. If you are looking for a prospective husband or wife, you exclude that person because that person is already betrothed to somebody else. I, I, am I talking to somebody? Are, are you getting what I'm saying? If somebody is engaged, it means the person has gone beyond the peripherals. They've gone beyond the surface. They've taken a deeper step into a relationship with the person they were friends with before. Am I explaining? The way you are quiet, I'm wondering whether you're understanding me. Am I speaking English or Greek? All right. Or oh, you want me to use other... Uh, Do you want me to, to use another example or oh, the married one? Is, because it looks like some people are getting uncomfortable. Okay. So, once we talk about engagement, we are talking about a relationship and we are talking about a certain type of love. The f love as a friend, love as a platonic friend, it's not the same as love as a boyfriend. And love, love as a boyfriend, girlfriend, is not the same as love as an engaged couple. Am I making sense? Because it's another, ex another step into the relationship. And love as engagement and love as marriage are two different things because you have taken a further step. So, in this month, we are taking another step in our intimacy with God. Amen. We are going be beyond the friendship. We are going be beyond the peripheral and take another step deeper into our relationship with God. John chapter 4. John chapter 4, verse 21 to 24. This is an encounter with a woman. Jesus had an encounter with a woman at the well. And the woman was... Uh, engaged by Jesus in a conversation and uh, at a point Jesus asked the woman if the, the woman actually said to Jesus our fathers have prophesied that the Messiah is coming and uh, when the, the Messiah comes he will teach us or lead us into a deeper relationship with God and Jesus said to the woman woman believe me the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship. For salvation is of the Jews. But, somebody say but. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Hallelujah. So the worship of God is not something that has to be done on the surface. It's not something that has to be done on the precipice. It's something that has to go a little deeper. It's something that has to be a little more intimate. It cannot be a surface or a corporate type of worship. Most of us, our worship to with God or to God is a corporate type of worship. We come to church. We pray in church. We come to church. The pastor says, open your Bible too. We open the Bible too. The pastor says we should read a, a, a passage. We read a passage. But as soon as we go home, we do not open the Bible. As soon as we go home, we do not pray. As soon as we go home, we do not worship. For instance, there are some of us, if I ask you to come and sing the worship song from beginning to end, you may not know the words. Because it is not something you practice at home. You only sing 
when you come to church and everybody is singing. When everybody is not singing, you don't have a song. Are you, are you getting what I'm saying? Because your relationship is a corporate type of relationship. This month, engage. We are disengaging in the corporate worship. And we are re-engaging in the personal private worship. Am I making sense? Because God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Spirit and truth is not done corporately. Spirit and truth is done as individuals. Worshiping God in spirit and truth starts by you and I developing an intimate relationship with God. So I started by saying that if you come into relationship or you come to uh, maybe a place, you have to be introduced. Is that, is that okay? So I come, sister, excuse me. I'm Chris, what's your name? Oh, it's nice to, to meet you. And uh, you also say it's nice to meet you. Our relationship is only just begun by hello, my name is, you also say your name is, and that is the end of the story. Then you go further, oh, is it okay for me to call you now and again? She says, okay, maybe yes. And they give you your num- they give you her, she gives you your number. We also exchange numbers. And then it's another. Then we begin to talk. Occasionally I call. Occasionally you call. Okay. Okay, this generation, as soon as I say, can I can you follow me on Instagram? That's I'll think about it. Then as soon as you leave, the person just Googles you and reads all your stats. And start to look at your, isn't it, your life on social media. Listen, stop living your life on social media. Stop living, putting the food you eat, the clothes you wear. Stop all that nonsense. (laughs) But, But what I'm trying to say is that, what I'm trying to say is that when you know somebody, you know, on initial stages, your knowledge is very limited. It takes a certain type of communication, conversation to deepen the relationship. And as you communicate and interact with each other, the relationship is going deeper and deeper and deeper. You know, like some people, they start, they will visit you with their friends because they are not sure about you. So it's corporate. Oh, yeah. I'm taking you out. They bring their friends along. Sisters, am I? Yeah. Oh, uh, can I come with my roommate? Yeah, sure. Why not? Then you also take your roommate because you are not sure of the person. A time will come when nobody will tell you to drop your roommate because you know that now we are on a date and the roommate cannot come because the conversation we are engaged in, it is not a a a type of conversation that the roommate can engage in. Are you getting what I'm saying? Yeah. And then it goes deeper and deeper until one day you take the person out or the person takes you out and in the conversation they propose to you and they bring a ring. Can somebody tell that gentleman to go and sit somewhere else? Hallelujah. And then you are like, oh, you accept it. Then you start taking pictures and you call your mother, you call your father, you call your girlfriends, you call everybody to tell them that he proposed and I accept it. Then the, the relationship still carries on, carries on. Then he goes past the engagement stage, goes past wedding, goes past first anniversary. You have a lot of bumps and uh, bruises now and again. And it goes and goes and goes until you get to 25 years. Now, you don't even have to talk. You know what the person is thinking. Because the relationship has gone beyond the initial. Are you getting what I'm saying? That is how our relationship with God is like. 
it has to go deeper and deeper and deeper. But you know that there are some t- type of friends, the place, the platonic level that you left them is the same level you stay with them till you die. Isn't it? You know them, but you know them up to this point. And that is where it stays till one of you dies. Because you are not prepared to go beyond that level. It is not that type of friendship. It's not that type of relationship. It's like we know each other up to this point. We've known of each other all these years. We've been neighbors. We've been uh, colleagues. We've been friends. We've been family friends. But that is where it stops. For some of us, our relationship with God is family friends. No. We have been neighbors for a very long time. Since we were young, we knew of God. Since we were young, our parents used to take us to their home. On occasionally on the weekends, we go and visit, and, and you know, go and eat lunch I, I, on Sundays in, in, in the place. We have breakfast with them. We have lunch with them. We've always had that Sunday roast. We go and eat Sunday roast at that place. Since I was in nursery, we eat Sunday roast there. When I got to secondary school, we we're eating Sunday roast there. When I got to uni, we we're eating Sunday roast. When I got married, they came. The next day, went to eat Sunday roast. When I had my children, they were there. We had Sunday roast. But that, that's the level. It does not go beyond it. We are neighbors. We are friends. We are colleagues. We, you know, we are family friends. But that is where it stops. So my question to you this evening is, what type of relationship are you engaged in? Look at another group of people in their relationship. First John 1. First John 1. From verse 3. From verse 1. Let's start from verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. So assume that the word of life is a person. His name is the word of life. We cooperate. We engage him. We heard of of him. We spoke to him. And then we, our hands handled him. Are you getting it? The life was manifest, manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard, declare, we declare to you. And that which we have, that you may also have fellowship with us. Truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. Amen. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you. That God is light, and to Him is, and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Amen. So we can tickle ourselves and laugh, and say we have handled Him, and say we have touched Him, and say we have spoken with Him. We know Him, but if our mannerism if our behavior, if our lifestyle is opposite or contrary to people who have handled him, then we are deceiving ourselves. We are walking in darkness thinking that we are in the light. That also says or suggests to me that there, are some t- there is a time that you may think that you are intimate with him, but you are not. You can deceive yourself. How many have been in a supposed relationship with somebody when the person didn't know that they were in a relationship with you? (laughs) You thought you were in a relationship. Uh, 
Can I can I use relationship as I think that's the easiest example. <laughs> oh, Pastor Sam, why? <laughs> he jitted me. He jitted me. I thought I was the one before I realized he was announcing his uh, wedding. And your heart broken. But when we start to talk with you and analyze, what made you think and convince yourself that you were in a relationship with that person? You realize that what they were saying is not really a relationship. It was a corporate. We used to go to his house. I, he, he took me here. He took us here. He took us. And when he comes, he always smiles at me. But he smiles with everybody. Oh, I'm, listen, I've been doing this job for a long time. I don't know whether you've realized. I've been doing this job for more than 25 years. And I can tell you, see, sometimes when somebody's uh, word is announced, some people come and cry in my office. Pastor, it's broken my heart. It's broken my heart. Oh, ask my sister. Ah. But uh, how did you convince yourself that you were in a relationship with this guy? Say, Pastor, you don't know. The way he looks at me is different from the way he looks at everybody. You, are you in somebody's eyes to know how he looks at the person? So Jesus said that some people will come and say, we, we taught in your name. We prophesied in your name. We hid in your name. I said, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I knew you not. Why? Because we thought we had a relationship. But we didn't have it. Because when a relationship is a relationship, there are certain criteria that have to be met. Am I making sense? When those criteria are not met, then you cannot convince me that you are in a relationship. Hallelujah. Pastor, pastor, he's broken my heart. He's broken my heart. Especially this type of sanguine type of guys. You know, the one who is nice with everybody, who put who put his hands around everybody, will laugh with everybody, will buy food for everybody, will put everybody in their car and drive them around. <laughs> Always being helpful to everybody. As you are being helpful, somebody has interpreted it to mean that I am exclusive. Without realizing that he, he does the same thing for everybody. Mr. Nice Guy, Mr. Super Helper, who will help you to move your, uh, your house, come and help you to re, uh, what do you call your wardrobe, you want to build your wardrobe, you call, he's Mr. Dependable. Come and take me shopping, he will come. Come and do this for me, he will come. Oh, uh, today I'm, I'm bored. I, 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 this, uh, do you want me to come and take you to a movie? Yes, come and take me, they, they will come. But just after they finish watching the movie with you, sister, other one has called. So he goes to the sister, other one, and tell them to Why movie again. <laughs> He's a very, generally a very nice guy all over the place. Relationships, the way in which two or more People are connected. I'm giving you a definition of a relationship. The way two or more people are connected. The state of being connected. If we say we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, the truth is not in us. We make him a liar, isn't it? And the truth is not in us. Fellowship means companionship. It means company. It means community of interest, activity, feeling, and experience. When we say some, we have fellowship, we have close companionship. When we say we have close uh, 
relationship, it means we have a certain interest, common interest. Is that okay? We have a certain corporate activity, corporate philo. Amen. One of the primary objectives of God for creating you and I was this thing, to have intimate relationship with man. Does that make sense? In Genesis 1, 20, uh, 6, 7, 8, he said, let us make man in our own image and uh, so that they will have dominion on the earth, just as we have dominion in heaven. Do, do you understand? Uh, uh, and you, you can't have relationship if you are not compatible, if you are not comparable. So he says, just as we have relig- uh, dominion on the, in heaven, let man have dominion on the earth, and let the earth and the air, so that we can have close relationship. In Mark chapter 4, uh, Jesus calls his disciples. And the Bible says he prayed all night. And in the morning, he chose, I think it's 13, verse 13 or 14, thereabouts. Have you found it? No. Mark chapter 3, sorry. Mark chapter 3. I'll come to chapter 4 in a minute. Chapter 3, verse 13. The Bible says that he went up to the mountain to pray, and then he called him those he he himself wanted, and they came to him. Verse 14. And he appointed that they might be with him, and that they might he might send them out to go and preach. So what was the first objective of Jesus? His first objective for picking the 12 disciples was so that they might be with him. Are you with me? And then he sends them out. The sending out does not supersede the being with. Am I making sense? His first primary objective is that they must be with him. So our primary reason for being in in God, in Christ, is not so that we'll become super spiritual and go and weed souls for Christ. But he wants us to be with him. First of all. So if we are doing everything else but not being with him, then there is a problem. Are you with me? There are certain uh, married couples that will do everything but being with each other. They will look after the children, they will cook, they will clean, they will wash, they will do everything, but they hardly talk to each other. I call them professional wife and professional husband. They are professionally married. They are not even friends anymore. So as soon as you, you, you come home, honey, how are you? Uh, have the kids eaten? Did they have homework? Is every homework done? Say, okay. Was there any problem? No. Uh, the, the bill has not been paid. Is okay. I'll sort it out. Then you go and do whatever. One is going to have a shower. One is cooking, uh, warming the food. One comes back, eats, and then they go and sit in front of TV, and they play with their phone, and then they fall asleep, and next morning they go. And uh, in the, during the day, they will send texts, are you okay? Is everything all right? Have the kids gone to school? Yes. Uh, please get eggs, uh, onions, pepper, and uh, uh, to- toilet paper and chicken wings when you are coming home. Then he to pass by and get toilet uh, paper and chicken wings and then drop them home. Uh, is it okay? Everything sorted out. There is no... Do you understand what I'm saying? But the marriage was not for all this toilet paper and chicken wings. <laughs> Do you understand? Or oh, the children. The children and toilet paper and chicken wings is an offshoot of the relationship. The initial or the main reason is to be with him. That is it. As when you are being with him, there will come other things. But those other things don't supersede their being with. Are you getting what I'm saying? You can easily, you can easily get to a place where you 
you disengage yourself in the marriage. Do you understand what I'm saying? A lot of people get divorced at the 18th, 19th, and 20th year of their relationship. Do you know why? You want me to tell you why? No. At the 18th year, 19th year, the children are graduating. They are growing. The children are about to leave the home. When the children fly out of the nest, then the husband and the wife realize that they didn't have any relationship. Everything they had between them was through the children. Now that the children are no more, they realize, hey, we haven't been with each other. We have finished our job. So you see that because the husband has been disengaged for a very long time, he starts to engage himself with some little young girls on the side. Find some shrimp and then be with them. I, I, you get what I'm saying? And, and all those things come as a result of not being with each other. This is a litmus test. I'll give, do you want me to give you a litmus test? Can you be in a room with your spouse for a whole weekend without a phone, without television, without the children, and not get bored? I think I'll leave some of these things for uh, as we go on to the marriage. How, how many are looking forward to next week and next? It's going to be very, very powerful. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we'll get to know the seasons and times in marriages that you have to be, you have to mark. Nine, 18th, 19th, 20th year is very crucial. And then 26, 27, 28 year is also crucial. And 31st, 32nd, 33rd year is also crucial. Then the 40th year is also crucial because by then, one is getting sick. So now it's going to be you looking after, who is, one is looking after the other. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> Hallelujah. But the primary objective was happening. <laughs> that, that is why, that is why when you are old. So you see, one of the things is that when you marry somebody who's way younger than you, you have more problems because as you are getting disengaged in terms of illness and then the person is still active, that adds more pressure. Do, do you understand? Anyway, we'll talk about that next as we go on. <laughs> Luke chapter 10, verse 17. We, I, I said this to you the other day that Engagement also brings its dangers in the sense that engagement brings power. Do you understand? The platonic relationship with a lot of communication entered into engagement. That also entered into marriage. That also entered into uh, a certain place where you are your missus. Assuming you are Mrs. Dangote. All of a sudden, you control a lot of wealth and a lot of power. Not because you, you are worth that much, but because of the engagement and because of your uh, intimacy with the person, all of a sudden, you have authority. Look at this. Then the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Verse 18. 
And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Read on. Behold, I give you authority to trample serpents and scorpions and over the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, someone say nevertheless. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice rather that your names are written in heaven. Rather rejoice in the fact that you have intimacy with me because you can easily be power drunk. You can easily get to a place where you are just uh, uh, feeling important because of the power of the name you carry. Can you imagine Mrs. Dangote goes around ordering people about and doing, and meanwhile she's forgotten that she's a wife and so does not do wifely duties. It can go about two, three weeks she hasn't spoken to her husband because she's just sitting somewhere in the south of uh, France lying on the beach by herself. And this man is also somewhere. If you get to a point, the man will say, this marriage, I don't think it is beneficial to me. So he says, you know what? Let's go our separate ways. All of a sudden, the woman's power and whatever she was carrying is gone. Are you getting it? And somebody else takes that power, like Vashti lost her power, and Esther took off that power. She just rolled to the sunset. Nobody heard. She rolled to oblivion. The, her story ended when she disengaged. Am I making sense? In the same way, our engagement brings us a certain authority. But let not that authority confuse us. Hello? Let that, not, that authority not make us disengage from our relationship with God. Don't be too busy that your relationship with God becomes corporate. You know, most people start being intimate with God and God promotes them and God elevates them. And sometimes the elevation brings a lot of power and that power makes them disengage. I, I, I don't know whether I, I won't share it. I'll get in trouble. I, I reported my wife to my son and my wife to my daughter because of something. And, and my son said, rightly so. And my complaint was because she was engaged in something else. Are you getting it? And I felt that she should have been engaged in something else. So there was a misunderstanding there. But it's been sorted. Don't think too much. <laughs> but I was trying to bring that conscious mind that number one still remains number one. Sometimes a, a, a wife becomes a mother and all her con concentration and attention goes to the child. And the husband feels alienated. Feels like they are a disturbance and a nuisance. They feel like an ex-boyfriend who, who <laughs> the baby has just displaced. Sometimes you are, you are asked to go and sleep in the other room because you are disturbing. The baby wants to sleep and you are making noise. They want to put the baby here in the middle. <laughs> And the baby has not to adjust. You just, and the baby, eh, that means you have to <laughs> disengage it. <laughs> if you don't take care, you will lose your spouse. Are, are you, are you getting it? What I'm trying to make us understand is that it doesn't matter how you, you far you go with God. Never lose your intimacy with him. Jesus was saying to the disciples, do not rejoice because demons are subject to you. Don't rejoice because you are healing and uh, having signs and wonders all over the place. It doesn't matter. The signs and wonders is because of your secret engagement with me. 
And the more you engage, the more power you have. The less you engage, the less power you have. Uh, am I making sense? So my prayer for us is that we continue to engage our God. Amen. We continue to have close fellowship with him. Amen. There is Moses and there is Israel. Now, Moses had a certain relationship with God that was different from what Israel had. Am I making sense? The Bible says, I think Psalm 103, go to Psalm 103, verse 7, I believe. Bible says, he made known his ways to Moses, but his acts to the children of Israel. And that's because their relationship was different. Am I making sense? Knowing the ways of somebody is not the same as the acts. The acts are just the actions. You understand? For instance, you may know the actions, my actions. Now, as a pastor, he gets very happy quickly, and he gets very angry even more quickly. That's the acts. But you may not know the ways. Do you get it? I, I, I used to pastor a church, and when, I, when I'm pastoring, you know, sometimes somebody, I can shout at the person, you! Come and, sit, come and sit down in front of everybody. And the person will just come and say, you, I'll just shout at the person. And then the pastor was coming to take over from me. And he saw me shouting at people and ordering people about. So as soon as I left and he took over the church, he also started shouting at somebody, yes, you come and sit down. And I'm thinking, let this be the last time Whatever the church does, I will be there. You don't know me. A person too can shout all he wants. But if I come and try and sit down, and then the person calls me, <laughs> say, this is what has happened. Why? Because the acts and the ways are different. I can shout because I have a certain relationship. I have a certain that you don't have. So if you try using the same thing, Paul, I know. Jesus, I know. But you, who are you? <laughs> are, are you getting, Moses knew beyond, I mean, Moses could turn the heart of God. Say, God, why are you going to destroy these people? I mean, did I do bad to them? And if you destroy them, don't you think the people will say that it's because you couldn't take them to the promised land, so you decided to kill them in the desert? Have you thought about this, God? And God said, mm, hmm. because of what you have said, I won't kill them again. It's a different level of relationship. For a man to change God's mind, it's a different thing. In Genesis 18, it says that, shall I destroy a people without telling my friend Abraham, seeing that he will leave his household? No, I have to tell my friend. I can't just go and do anything because he knows my ways. So I need to inform him. Are you getting it? In John 15, Jesus says that you are no longer, I do not call you servants anymore. I call you my friends. For a friend knows what the secret of another. Am I making sense? I do not call you servants anymore. You have graduated in your relationship because you've gotten to a place where you know my ways. We hang out, so you know my intentions. Hallelujah. In Mark chapter 4. 
Mark chapter 4, Jesus gives a parable, parable of the sower. And he says that, he preaches in a very funny way. I think from verse 9, there about. He preaches in a funny way. Anyone who has ear, let him hear. Verse 10. But when he saw, when he was alone, those around him with the 12 asked about the parable. He gave a certain parable, just repeat. The, can you imagine you come to church, the pastor preached, nobody understands. And he's not bothered to explain. He says that anyone who has an ear, let him hear. So the people come to him to his office after service. And they said to them, for you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom. But for those who are outside, all things are come in a parable. In parables. So that seeing they may not see, not perceive, and not perceive. And hearing that they may not hear and not understanding, understand, lest they should turn and their sins be forgiven them. And he said, do you understand this parable? Do, do you not understand this parable? How then would you understand all parables? Then he takes his time to break the parable down to those that he's intimate with. You know, so when you're intimate with God, God explains certain things that others don't understand. They will never understand until they go deep. Last, was it last week we saw in uh, Psalm 73 that uh, Paul, uh, David was saying that my foot almost slipped because I saw the prosperity of the wicked and I could not understand it. Till I went to the house of the Lord. Till I got a little bit intimate with God. Till I went a little bit deeper in my relationship with God. Then I understood why God allows certain things to happen. In our Christian relationship, we may never understand certain things unless we go deeper. Amen. So this month, we'll be going deeper. We'll be going deeper. My aim is that by the time we finish the next four, three, four weeks, our relationship with God will change. And it will not be corporate anymore. I think as a church, we are doing everything to help all of us to go deeper. Now we have lunch, our prayer. Please join it. It's from 12 to 1. It's on Zoom. Just join. It will help you to develop your own personal prayer time with God. You know that lunch time is a dead time. How many know what I'm talking about? It's the time that you use for nothing. You use to look at your phone because all day you have been away from social media. So now you have lunch at work. You want to catch up with your Facebook and uh, all the other things to see what is happening. Around you. No, use that time with God. Are you getting me? So lunchtime, log on and let's pray. Today, it was very powerful. How many joined? Only three. Even when you are working, you try and join. Stand to your feet. We'll continue next week. I want you to pray for yourself. Draw me close to you. Never let me go.
of mine. Help me find my way. Bring me back to you. you help us know that you are all that we need, all that we want, all that we ever need, Lord. Help us know that you are ever closer, oh God. Closer than the closest brother, closer than the closest friend. Help us, oh God, to draw closer to you in everything we do. Let us not just be corporate Christians, but let us become private Christians, Lord. People that follow you privately, 
that which we as individuals have handled, that which we as individuals have touched, that which we have seen and looked upon, Lord, that we will declare to others, not somebody else's God, but our own God. For the God that we serve, the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, he's a God of the individual. He's not the God of the corporate entity. He's not God of Israel. He's God of Jacob, Abraham, and Isaac. Let him be our God. Let him be God of Sam. Let him be God of Beulah. Let him be God of Ogechi. Let him be God of Abigail. God of individuals, Lord. In the name of Jesus. We thank you for your, your presence in this place. Help us to draw close in with you. In Jesus' name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Let's take an offering for the Lord. Have you been blessed this evening? Oh, just one person has been blessed. All right. Let's take a good offering for the Lord and get ready to go home. Amen. We are praying and um, we have um, our first chapel meeting tomorrow, is it? At 7, at 8 o'clock. So please, can you put the chapel um, details up? So there are so many chapels you can join. This year, make it a point to join a chapel. That is where the word of God is broken down. So join a chapel and be an active member. So Abigail Chapel, uh, whatever, what other. So you can take a picture of any of, if you are in university, University Chapel is also very powerful. We have Little London Chapel, Amley Bramley Chapel, Middleton Chapel, Joshua Chapel, Caleb Chapel, and other chapels will be starting very soon. Amen. So join one of the chapels. If you couldn't catch the um, chapels, then you can see myself or any of the guys in front and they will help you. Amen. So to, uh, tomorrow chapel meeting, Friday we are praying here and we have um, impact at 7 o'clock, isn't it? Impact. We have impact. Okay. All right. So, have I left any announcements out? Saturday prayer, Jollof. Okay. Start at 6, 7. Okay. All right. Amen. Stand to your feet. Let's go home. And today is uh, our first birthday. So, do well to call him, wish him a happy birthday, send him a text. Amen. When I spoke to him last, he was on his way from Bristol back here. Amen. All right. Father, we thank you for every pocket that has given. We ask that you bless your people. I pray, Lord, your grace, your, your mercy, your blessing, your protection, and peace be upon everyone in the sound of my voice in Jesus' name. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen.